Well, good to see all of you here this morning. Is it good to be here this morning? <laughs> all right, good. I was worried there for a second. Well, I'm going to be speaking to you this morning. Um, well, each of the speakers are going to be speaking on a different person in the family, and they're going to be connecting that to a different person in church history. And I'm probably going to be the most different because I'm going to be talking about the single person in the family of God. So if you happen to be single here this morning, and you are thinking, well, you know, maybe this conference doesn't really apply to me, I'm not yet married, I don't yet have children, you need to understand that it certainly does apply to you. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7 actually tells us that there is a special blessing that God has for singles, and it calls that undistracted devotion to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. And if you think about it, um, almost everyone spends at least the first couple decades in their life um, single. And then very often, one spouse will die uh, well beforehand, before the other spouse, and then you spend the end of your life, maybe a decade or so, single. So there's a lot, a large chapter in life that can be in your single years. And it's very important to understand that there is, in the Scripture, this special blessing of, um, of the kind of focus a person can have on the kingdom of God be, that, is, um, that is shifted when a person becomes married and starts to you know, manage their family. And of course, that's where their attention should be, but there is a kind of focused attention in that direction, as opposed to when you're single, a different kind of, of focused direction. But the tragedy is very often people in their single years um, end up developing some really bad habits. They end up, you know, especially younger people might end up becoming video game heroes or fall into patterns of serial dating or develop skills of laziness because they don't have anyone, you know, directly looking over their shoulder, and they don't spend this incredibly valuable period of time um, building a foundation uh, for the future. Instead, they squander it on themselves. And so, the person that I'm going to look at this morning is the most influential church father, period, but he's also the most influential single church father, and that is uh, St. Augustine. And Augustine is incredibly influential. If you were to bump into Luther and Calvin, Luther and Calvin would not call themselves Calvinists. They would call themselves Augustinian. They would see their theology as largely shaped by Augustine. Uh, I'm going to try to say Augustine instead of Augustine because I've been told Augustine is a place in Florida and, <laughs> and Augustine is the man. So I'll, I'll try to break that, that bad habit. So I'm going to show you four lessons from his life and obviously, this talk is to apply to the single person so you can see yourself as a child in the family of God, but these points are easily applicable to anyone, no matter what stage of life they're in. So we're going to look at these four lessons. So Augustine lived from 354 to 430. That was his, his window of his earthly life. And the first lesson that we learn is we need to reject the stupidity of self-focused pleasure to reject the stupidity of self-focused pleasure. Augustine was born in a little North African town called Tagusta. Uh, his father was a Roman pagan. His mother was a devout Christian, Monica, who faithfully prayed for his salvation. His mother longed for his salvation. His father uh, didn't care about any of that. All he cared about was that Augustine would grow up and have a successful career, be a successful rhetorician, really didn't care about Augustine's character at all. While Augustine was always a good student, his uh, passion was for self-indulgence. And when he was 11 years old, he was sent to uh, Mariuris, which was 20 miles south of Tagaste, where uh, he, he would go on for schooling. And uh, right from that early age, he reflects, he remembers, he just boldly gave himself to pleasures. So it was there in Mariuris where he reflects upon hanging out with some of his friends, and they all say, hey, let's, let's steal some pears off the pear tree of this farmer. And they do that, and they don't do that because they're hungry, because they're going to go and, and sell the pears. They do it purely 
out of the pleasure of doing something that's wrong. And that started very young, but as he got older and moving through his teens, it began to look like drunkenness, and it began to look like sexual immorality, and he just continued to squander his life pleasing himself. And by the age 17, he went off to Carthage to further his studies in rhetoric. And Carthage was definitely a learning capital, but it was also something like the Las Vegas of the day. It was a, it was a very wicked place, and so once Augustine got to Carthage, he just gave himself fully to sexual immorality, all kinds of immorality. He reflects and he says about that time, I went to Carthage where I found myself in the midst of a hissing cauldron of lusts. My real need was for you, my God, who are the food of the soul. I was not aware of this hunger. So I, my real need was you, God, but I just fed my flesh. And it was here where he would take a concubine, have a child with her, and live with her for many years. Now his mother was brokenhearted about all this but his father just was amused. As long as he does well in school, as long as he's advancing his career, who cares? And during that time, Augustine probably didn't care that his father was indifferent to his character, but as he grew and became wiser and looked back, he realized that was evidence of a real lack of love in his father. And he would reflect on that, and he would say this, as I grew to manhood, I was inflamed with desire for an excess of hell's pleasures. My family made no effort to save me uh, from my fall by marriage. In other words, maybe they could have found me a good wife and rescued me from all of this. They didn't even try. Their only concern was that I should learn how to make a good speech and how to persuade others by my words. And then he says of his father, he took no trouble at all to see how I was growing in your sight, O God, or whether I was chaste or not. He cared only that I should have a fertile tongue. And so it was easy, when you have a father who doesn't care like that, to just justify it and give yourself to all those pleasures. But it was while he was in Carthage that God providentially moved upon him to grow embarrassed about the way he was just living for self-pleasure. Even though he loved his sin, there was something that I'll mention in a second that God brought into his life that perhaps would be the equivalent of you know, finding yourself just spending hours scrolling through brain rot on the phone or, you know, just squandering your time and realizing this is just a waste of human existence. What am I doing here? And what God used to do that was a book that is now no longer in existence. It was Cicero's Hortensius. He was an ancient Greek writer. And um, from what we know about Hortensius, it was basically a dialogue that took place between these four men where they talked about how people are supposed to spend their leisure time, and it was a brutal mockery of people who waste their time. It was just brutally mocking people who sit around and use their time for pleasure instead of the pursuit of wisdom and the pursuit of truth. And so it might be something equivalent to a young man stumbling upon Jordan Peterson's, you know, 12 Rules for Life. You're not going to find the gospel in there, but it tells you, make your bed, get a job, and stop being a bum. (laughs) And that's the message that Augustine got. I need to be wiser with my time. And he actually looks back at this time and realizes it was the providential hand of God. He says, It altered my outlook on life. All my empty dreams suddenly lost their charm, and my heart began to throb with a bewildering passion for the wisdom of eternal truth. In Greek, the word philosophy means love of wisdom, and it was with this love that Hortensius inflamed me. And so this was a providential wake-up call to Augustine. Again, not as a Christian, not getting any closer to God, but realizing I just need, need to grow up. Now's the time um, to act more responsibly. And so God used that to really show him the shame of squandering our time, looking at our so-called free time and just spending it on personal pleasure. So I think that's the first lesson. We just need to reject the stupidity of self-focused pleasure filling our life, thinking that's how to maximize meaningful existence. The second lesson we can learn from him is reject faddish popular truth claims. Reject faddish popular truth claims. I think it's important for young people especially to understand that just by nature of being young and inexperienced means you're going to be more susceptible to a lot 
of the faddish truth claims that are out there, whether it's in the form of social justice, whether it's in the form of critical theories, whether it's in the form of what I think is taking place in the evangelical world, which is a kind of rebirth of a, of a reconstructionism, getting us to focus all our energy on how to change culture and how to influence pol politics. And, you know, that, that deserves good attention, but it doesn't deserve all our attention. And so um, the susceptibility of young people to jump on board of certain movements because they're edgy, because they're trendy, because they're controversial, just to realize the tendency of young people to do that, to realize if you're a young person, your own tendency to do that. Every person has to kind of go through that stage. So Augustine had this, particularly when it came to the Manichaeans, which we'll talk about. So at age 21, uh, there's Augustine in Carthage, but Augustine receives a job offer to go to Rome, and it's a very prestigious job. But his mother Monica knows that in Rome, there's even more pleasures than Carthage. There's even more gods, false gods. And so Monica does not want him to go and says, Augustine, don't go. And he says, I'm going to go. And as the protective mom she is, she says, fine, I'll go with you. <laughs> and Augustine says, fine, come with me. But he gives her the wrong departure times of the ship that would take them. So when she goes to the docks, the ship left the day before. And so he deceives his mother, he goes off to Rome. But when he gets there, he is ready to apply Hortensius. And so he begins his quest for truth. And his quest for truth, believe it or not, actually begins with the Bible. He knows the Bible is, is touted as a source of wisdom. But Augustine begins to read the Bible, and he is appalled by the behavior of the patriarchs, basically. Uh, he doesn't yet know how to understand the Bible. He thinks that there's sin in the Bible. The Bible must be endorsing that sin. He doesn't realize it's just the, the reading of history and, and the record of sin. And so uh, he doesn't want anything to do with the Scripture. And so the big youth religion of the day was Manichaeism. And so he jumps headlong into that. Manichaeism had uh, branded itself as sort of the pinnacle of wisdom, had many great thinking heads, many great intellectual lights in Manichaeism. It was really the idea that um, uh, we are rays of light trapped inside these, these ugly, sinful, evil, corporeal bodies, and you have to prepare yourself for the afterlife, and you do that by absorbing as much light or as much wisdom, as much truth as possible, and that prepares you for when you die and you get reabsorbed into whatever is ultimate and divine out there. Uh, but it had branded itself as successfully as the, on the intellectual cutting edge. And so Augustine swallowed it, hook, line, and sinker um, for nine years at least. Some people even think up to 11 years, but he was a Manichaean up until the age of 29, so basically all his 20s. But while he was in Rome, Augustine met a man named Symmachus, who was a powerful statesman. He was a conservative. He wanted to return Rome back into the, um, the, 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 the glory days of the ancient gods. And he interacted with Augustine and realized this man is incredibly knowledgeable and incredibly eloquent. And so he offers Augustine what would become his job for quite some time, which is basically the, the chair of rhetoric for the emperor. So he would be the, the spin doctor, he would be the propaganda machine, he would be, you almost could compare him to the, the press secretary for the president. And so for a man trained in, trained in rhetorician, this would be pretty much the most powerful job you could ever expect to get. And he's getting it in maybe his, his mid-20s an incredibly powerful position. He is on top of the world. And so he enjoys that position. He's very successful at it for quite some time. You, you can't get higher than that. That'd be the dream job, and he's got it, and he's still a young man. But around the age 29, um, God did three different things to begin to shake his faith in the Manichaeism that he had so passionately believed. Uh, one was God providentially caused him to move from the city of Rome to Milan, which meant he got out of the Manichaean bubble, because that's where the bubble was. It was sort of the mecca of Manichaeism, Rome. So he leaves Rome, he goes to Milan. And in Milan, he starts to read a lot of Plato, the ancient philosopher Plato. And Plato um, has a much more accurate understanding of the divine nature than Manichaeism did. Um, Plato contemplates what kind of divine nature is necessary to account for reality, and he gets pretty close, pretty accurate in his understanding of it. Um, ju just to kind of uh, briefly understand the tension here, Manichaeism taught that the divine nature is a finely diffused physical substance spread throughout space. It's not 
purely immaterial, not purely supernatural. It's a finely diffused substance. They thought it had to be material, physical in some way in order for the divine nature to be meaningfully interactive with creation. But Plato said that if God was a finely diffused material, if he was material at all, he would be in need of a maker. He would be subject to time and space, and, and he himself would be in need of a creator. So really, the only kind of God that it could account for reality is a God who is totally immaterial and a God who is totally immutable and unchanging. And that was just anathema to Manichaean belief. So here he is pouring over Plato, and a lot of this is resonating with him, but it's absolutely a contradiction to the Manichaean philosophy. And the second thing that shook Augustine's faith in Manichaeism was as he was bubbling with these questions, these real you know, existential questions, people kept saying, you need to talk to Faustus of Milev. He was sort of the recognized leader of the Manichaean movement. He will answer all your questions. He's the guru. He's the guy to talk to. And finally, Faustus comes into town, and Augustine can't wait to him. He sits down and talks with him, and Faustus got nothing to offer. His responses are totally empty. And in fact, after his conversation with Faustus, Faustus says to Augustine, would you mind being my tutor? <laughs> You're so knowledgeable in these things. Would you mind discipling me? Which you would think would be uh, very flattering, but Augustine is just, you know, heartbroken by it. His big questions were not answered. Now, you think about this, at this point in Augustine's life, all his, mo you could say, his most <clears throat> influential political contexts are going to be Manichaean. Augustine himself is increasingly being seen as one of the primary leaders in the Manichaean philosophy and Manichaean religion. The best career move would be to keep your doubts to yourself It'd be like finding yourself in the midst of the social justice mob and saying, I'm having second thoughts about this. <laughs> You're not allowed to have second thoughts about it. And he's starting to verbalize his second thoughts. So you could say this was career sabotage. Just, just keep it quiet. Keep it to yourself. But even at this point, God is giving Augustine this refusal to not just buy into popular philosophies because of the way they're branded, or, or because they look trendy, or because they boast some brainy people, but if they're not answering basic worldview questions, then don't give them the time of day. And so he's caught between a rock and a hard place in this, in this particular uh, crux in his life. And then there was a third thing that God used to shake his belief in Manichaean philosophy, and this third thing is actually the third lesson that we're going to learn from the life of Augustine. And this lesson is to receive discipleship from godly saints. To receive discipleship from godly saints. So, um, sermons have a place. Uh, uh, what I mean by that is sermons you download and listen to. Um, podcasts have a place. YouTube. But nothing replaces one-on-one -on -one discipleship, right? Eyeball to eyeball face-to-face, -face, meaningful discipleship with an older woman if you're a woman, with an older man if you're a man, and that is the third thing that Augustine began to experience that began to shake his faith in his Manichaean philosophy. So while Augustine's Manichaeism was crumbling there in Milan, he began to attend the most famous church that was there. It was St. Ambrose's church, and he attended for all the wrong reasons. St. Ambrose was eloquent. Augustine was always trying to grow in his eloquent as as being a, on the chair of, of, of rhetoric, and so he goes to listen to Ambrose only for the, the eloquent skills, the rhetorical skills he might get. But after a while, he starts to actually listen to the content that Ambrose is preaching. And Ambrose is teaching Augustine how to actually read the Bible, how to understand the Bible, how the Bible makes sense of reality. Now, as I was reading this, I thought this must be incredibly humbling for, for Augustine. Because here he is, one of the great intellects in the world, and the one thing he doesn't know anything about at this point in his life is the Bible. And that's intentional, because he doesn't think the Bible is the source of truth. So he's very ignorant of the Scriptures, but he then begins to sit under the leadership of a pastor who knows a ton of the Scriptures. And you would think for someone of this kind of a power and authority, that would be very humbling to do. But that's exactly what he does. He humbles himself and begins to learn under uh, St. Ambrose, and while he's learning under him, Augustine's main sticking points, his main answers that um, Faustus could not answer begins to be answered, and one of his main problems was, um, if God is immutable, how can he be personally involved? 
I mean, if he's truly unaffected by what we do, and he's unchanged by the turpitudes of human history, well, that, that, that's great for God, but how can we say we can have a personal relationship? How can he even be meaningfully involved? And Augustine explains how he got his question answered. He writes this, Is truth, then, nothing simply because it is not spread out through space, either finite or infinite? So that's what the Bible, that's what Plato is telling him. God is not a finely diffused substance, and Augustine's thinking is, well, if he's not, then he's nothingness. If he's truly supernatural and immaterial, doesn't that make him absolute nothingness? But then he starts, is this really true? Does he become nothingness because he's immaterial? And then he goes on to say, then from afar you cried out to me, by no means, for I am who I am. So Ambrose takes him to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, which is this wonderful statement on the immutability of God in a context of God's personal involvement in the life of his people. So God's saying, I am immutable and I'm personally involved. And I don't know if that so much removed the mystery for Augustine or just communicated the reality that God is capable <laughs> of being unchanging and intimately evolved in the history of his people. But that was satisfactory for Augustine. Now, we know that salvation is not merely intellectual. At this point in Augustine's life, he is um, being intellectually satisfied, and so he's excited to tell his mom, he's a catechumen of the church, aren't you, aren't you happy for me? And you might think his mom would slap him on the back and say, well, this is great, especially, you know, you said the sinner's prayer, you did the Romans row, this is great, I have no more doubts whatsoever, and he tells his mother this, and what does Monica say to him? She says, God would have you be a full believer, not a half believer, because <laughs> she knows his son. She knows he's saying, I'm being intellectually satisfied. I'm even a catechumen, a disciple in the church, but she knows he has not surrendered his life to God, that he's still living in the world, and salvation, authentic salvation, is a full surrender to God. So during this time, there's an amazing tug of war, you know, the spiritual tug of war is taking place. He's being intellectually satisfied. He doesn't want to give up his life of sin, so he's being pulled in two different directions, and it's during this time that something really amazing happens. Justina, who's the wife, the empress, the wife of Valentina, hates the pastor Ambrose. She wants Ambrose's basilica for herself, so she sends out soldiers to surround the basilica and take it for herself. And Ambrose hears about this. He shoots out an email to his congregation, and he tells them, fill the church, and basically we're going to have a peaceful protest. These are my words, okay? <laughs> so worship services during COVID were not the first peaceful protest. This is going on here. Ambrose, they fill the church, they're not, they're not taking the church building. And so it's filled with his congregants, they're singing, they're praying, Roman soldiers surround the basilica, and this is the Roman Empire, it's a pagan emperor, they could have, it could have easily ended up being a bloodbath. Um, but it's not, the Roman soldiers stand down. Now the history doesn't tell us where Augustine was during this period of time, but it does tell us shortly after this, Augustine came to Christ. Now I want you to think about Augustine's situation. At that point, Augustine would have been a political leader whose job was to communicate the will of the emperor. And at that time, he would have been a catechumen in St. Ambrose's church. So you could not imagine a more difficult place to be. I like Ambrose, I like this church, I like my cushy job, and they are both at loggerheads. Now, we would love for history to tell us what Augustine did during that time. But history does tell us it was shortly after this that Augustine gave his life to Christ. So it could have been this event where God is saying, Augustine, you're going to have to pick a side, right? You, you can't serve God and serve man. You're going to have to pick a side, which is exactly what he do, does. So it is important. Receive discipleship from godly saints. That has a massive impact in Augustine's life. And then the fourth and final lesson, recover the cruciform life. Take up your cross and follow Christ. Stop putting it down, take it up, and serve God once and for all. All people have to make the decision, especially young people when you have so many things vying for you. Take up your cross and follow Christ. So Augustine is experiencing this tug of war, intellectually being satisfied, doesn't want to give up his life, his heart is not contrite before God. And one of the final death blows to his selfishness is reading Athanasius' biography, The Life of Anthony. And Anthony was the founder of, of monasticism, 
But when Augustine read this, it was less about becoming a monastic and more about being willing to give up everything and follow Christ. And that's really what con convicted Augustine. Why am I not willing to give up everything to follow Christ? I, I know now more than ever how valuable Christ is. Why can't I just give up my sins and, and follow Christ? And he was terrified of giving it up. And so he's struggling with this fear. Um, and, and then he finds himself, and this is, of course, the, the scene that most of us know about the life of Augustine. He finds himself in this garden, the garden of his friend, and he's just wrestling, and he's praying, and he's in torment. He describes his, his, his state of mind. He said, I tore my hair and hammered my forehead with my fists. I locked my fingers. I hugged my knees. I mean, imagine being in that kind of torment. And it's because he knows what the gospel demands. You have to give your life up. You have to give up. It's not about you anymore. And he's terrified that if he gives up, uh, I don't know, he'll have no more pleasure. He, he's, he just doesn't want to do it. But later he writes this. And while I stood trembling at the barrier, on the other side I could see the chaste beauty of continence or self-control. Okay? I could see this chaste beauty of self-control in all her serene, unsolid joy as she modestly beckoned me to come over and to hesitate no more. She stretched out loving hands to welcome and embrace me. He sees the personification of modesty and prudence and self-control, saying, it's all right. You can give up your pleasures. You can give up your life. Come to this side. And he imagines her beckoning and that's when he hears a child say, take up and read. It's actually similar to Anthony's conversion that he, book he had just read. And then he opens the scroll. He reads Romans 13, 13. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity or sensuality, not in strife or jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. And when he read that, it bowled him over and he surrendered finally. To the person of Christ. He spent the first 30 years of his life giving himself to his pleasures, and he would spend the last 40 years of his life celibate. It's not God's will for everyone, but it was for him, celibate, uh, serving the kingdom as a single person. Relenting of this tug of war um, proved to unlock the beauty and the sweetness of God. And so I want to end by reading probably the most famous quote of Augustine, but I think the most relevant quote, there's a reason it is the most famous quote, because it's at the heart and soul of what he came to experience in Christ. He says, How sweet did it suddenly become to me to be free of the sweets of folly. Things that I once feared to lose, it was now joy to put away. You cast them forth from me, you, my true and highest sweetness, you cast them forth, and in their place you entered in. Sweeter than every pleasure, but not to flesh and blood. Brighter than every light, but deeper within me than any secret retreat. Higher than every honor, but not to those who exalt themselves. So he said, I found God to be sweeter than every sin that I abandoned, more honorable than the honor that men could heap upon you, which Augustine had experienced. I found God to be so much better than the life that I was clamoring for. Because that's what self-indulgence for so many years does. It convinces you there's no way God can be sweeter than the sins that I'm experiencing. And Augustine experienced what every true Christian experiences. Indeed, God can be and God is sweeter than any sin and any passion that we fear to give up. So, if you're single, just ask yourself the question, if someone were to look at your life, where they look at your life and say, there's a person who spends their life in undistracted devotion to God. Or they say, there's a person who's got one foot in the world and they're trying to have one foot in the church. Or would they see you're taking advantage of that precious closing window of time of single soul devotion to the Lord? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this example in the life of Augustine. We pray, Lord, that we would be motivated uh, from our brother in Christ to live devoutly to you. In Jesus' name, amen.